academic affairs. And I have the pleasure of um, kicking off the university lecture series for this academic year with Dr. Ghislaine Lewis. So let me um, give you just a little bit more information about the series itself. Um, founded in 2018 upon our becoming a university, the university lecture series features scholars and experts from the University of Lynchburg and celebrates their roles as educators, mentors, and researchers who make a real impact on our campus and beyond. We are so happy to invite our entire campus community as well as the general public to come and learn from their fascinating insights. This evening, we acknowledge the Monacan Indian Nation as the traditional stewards of the land on which the University of Lynchburg now sits, and we offer our respect to the Monacan people, past, present, and emerging. Dr. Ghislaine Lewis is with us this evening. She's an Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Co-Chair of Africana Studies at the University. She serves at the as the advisor for both the university's campus newspaper, The Critograph, and the African Caribbean Union. She teaches classes in Communication Studies, Africana Studies, and in the Masters of Nonprofit Leadership Program. She's a trainer of Lynchburg's National Coalition Building Institute, NCBI, team. She serves on several campus-wide committees, including the Leadership Task Force and as the chair of the Faculty Development Committee for this academic year. I'm really not sure when she sleeps, honestly. <laughs> she is also the director of the Pierce Street Gateway, where she is a founding member of the Pierce Street Community Garden. Dr. Lewis serves as the president of the Central Virginia Academy for Nonprofit Excellence, known locally as CVANE, is on the board for the LINK Project and on the exhibition committee for the Legacy Museum of African American History. Her love of travel and passion for the classroom have taken her on adventures around the globe. Her academic work and experiences have provided valuable insight into the linkages between new media, global politics, and policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis as she presents News, China, and the Recolonization of the Caribbean. So thank you all for joining me here tonight, and thank my students for showing up. <laughs> Thank you, Provost Jabonski, for inviting me to give the first lecture in this year's university lecture series. I will pre be presenting on news, China, and the recolonization of the Caribbean. My notes are acting up. So, in the past few months, we've been inundated with news of China, particularly as we consider conflict with Russia and conflict with the Ukraine. Just last week, S Secretary of State Anthony Blinken accused China of speeding up its process to seize Taiwan. Newspapers around the world this past week have covered everything per from President Xi's third term to the plunge in the stocks of Chinese companies and current diplomatic relations between the US and China. While all of these are important things for us to consider, I think it's important that we focus on China's influence a little closer to home. So tonight, I will be giving a brief regional overview for those of you who haven't been to the Caribbean. I will talk about colonization in the Caribbean, the Belt and Road Initiative. I will also talk about China in the Caribbean, the concerns, and then how do we plot the way forward diplomatically. So for a little bit of context, the Caribbean is my home. 
I am West Indian. I'm proud of it. Um, I was born in Guyana, which is the only English-speaking country in South America. I spent my formative years there, and then I finished up high school in Jamaica. Of the 28 countries in the region, I've worked, visited, and lived in 13 of them. The region is home to a population of 44 million citizens, with the largest countries being Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti. As with many tourism-dependent countries in the Global South, the region is home to a multiplicity of ethnic groups and belief systems. Many <laughs> descriptions of the Caribbean, particularly as a West Indian, can feel very reductive. It is undeniable that the region is beautiful. For generations, it has served as the perfect vacation destination. But these countries are home to people with complex histories that have, in many instances, been shaped by colonization, starting first with Christopher Columbus, and then later with slavery and indentured servitude, and then, more recently, with what can at times be seen as an exploitative tourism sector. So considering China's relationship, and by extension, Taiwan's relationship with the region in each of these countries wouldn't work in the 45 minutes that I'm allotted. <laughs> and so I thought I would narrow my focus to look at Jamaica, Grenada, Dominica, the Bahamas, Antigua, and Guyana. Still a lot, but we'll do it in two seconds each. So before we delve into China, I think it's really important that we think about the legacy of colonization in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean has been colonized by the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the English, who were all in search of fortunes in the East Indies. In August of 1518, King Charles authorized Spain to ship enslaved people directly from Africa to the Caribbean. Barbados became the first large-scale con colony to be populated by a black majority, and this began over 300 years of black enslavement that, that quickly became the mechanism for social and economic prosperity in the hemisphere. On August 1, many Anglophone countries in the region celebrate Emancipation Day, marking the end of slavery in 1834 from the British Empire and the 1838 ab abolition of apprenticeship, which forced formerly enslaved people to work for their masters without compensation. Emancipation wasn't a gift. The Slavery Abolition Act, which banned slavery in the British colonies, allowed the shift in, British, um, in the British Empire's economic interests. Post-slavery, many Caribbean countries fought for in their independence from their colonizers. Beginning in the 1950s, there was a regional shift to self-governance, with governments varying from parliamentary democracies to special municipalities, to constituent countries, to republics, to territories, to commonwealth, and to finally to federal parliamentary democracies. In the 21st century, the region has struggled with the effects of climate change, dependence on the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, tourism dependency, and at times floundering economies that are exacerbated by high levels of unemployment and increasing poverty. This has made the region the perfect breeding ground for transnational crime and gangs. But it's all well and good to think about colonization, but I also want us to think about when the Chinese first arrived in the region. So talks of Chinese migration first began in 1802. The first Chinese emigrated to Trinidad and Tobago in 1806. 
and this marked the first organized settlement of Chinese in the region. After this initial settlement, there were two waves of migration to the Caribbean. The first wave consisted of indentured servants who were brought predominantly to Trinidad, British Guyana, and Cuba to work on sugar plantations post-emancipation. It was felt that these free Chinese laborers would be a suitable substitute for African slave labor and the, that these civilized men would be an example of what would ultimately help to avert rebellion and forestall the awakening of a black empire as was seen in Haiti. This wave lasted from the 1850s to 1866 and approximately 18,000 Chinese emigrated to the region first for three year periods and then later for five year periods on contract. Chinese indentured servants ultimately didn't save the sugar industry post emancipation. In fact, many Chinese contract laborers bought themselves out of their contracts. The second wave comprised of free voluntary migrants to the region, consisting of small groups, usually families, to British Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad from the 1890s to the 1940s. In fact, the most modern Caribbean Chinese are descended from this second group. In much of the Caribbean, the descendants of the second group have pursued entrepreneurial professions. And it's that entrepreneurship that takes us to the Silk Road. The Silk Road, for those of you who studied history in high school, was a network of ancient trade routes established during China's Han Dynasty in 130 BCE. These routes link the regions of the ancient, ancient world in commerce between 130 BCE and 1453 CE. In the 16th century, these routes spanned nearly 4,000 miles across the globe, from Central Asia to the Middle East to Southern Europe. More recently, in 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced a new double trade corridor to reopen channels between China and its neighbors in Central Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. The Belt and Road Action Plan was released in 2015 and included the land routes, the belt, and the sea and maritime routes, the road. The overarching goal of the plan was to provide trade relationships with the, in the region through infrastructure investments. The Belt and Road Initiative is often referred to as the new Silk Road. The BRI is integral to China's foreign policy strategy, so much so that it was referenced in the Communist Party's constitution in 2017. Through the BRI, Chinese banks and companies fund and build roads, power plants, ports, railways, fiber optic cable routes around the world. So far, at least 215 cooperative Agreements have been signed in 149 countries and with 32 international organizations. 61 of those countries signed on in 2018. From roads and power plants in Pakistan and high-speed rail in Indonesia and bridges and hotels in Guyana, a hospital and a stadium in Dominica, Beijing is everywhere. China has ushered in a new era of globalization with the hopes to spend about $8 trillion this decade on infrastructure. Now that's not to say that the BRI hasn't been without its challenges. The World Bank noted that the belt and road transportation corridors have the potential to substantially improve trade and foreign investment conditions for citizens in participating countries, but only if China and the corridor of economies reform, uh, accept reforms that increase transparency, expand trade, improve debt, sustainability, mitigate environmental issues, 
and corruption risks. There have been criticisms that the Chinese have created a strategic trap under the BRI that will leave countries in debt and beholden to a foreign government. The Malaysian government canceled $3 billion worth of pipelines and renegotiated a rail project and cut their cost by $11 billion in 2018. In 2017, the Sri Lankan government announced a stake, uh, announced a 70% transfer of a stake to the Ham, Ham, <laughs> Hamban Tuta uh, port back to the China's merchant group and allowed the Chinese to lease the port and its surrounding land for 99 years. In late 2018, China moved to take over the Kenet Kanuna International Airport in Zambia for non-payment of debts. This year, Zambia canceled $1.6 billion in Chinese loans to avoid a debt trap. They negotiated a further $1.4 billion from the IMF to bail out and restructure some of its external debt. With these examples in mind, it's natural that the Caribbean citizenry is concerned about the region's growing dependence on Chinese aid. So I think the big question is, what's China's motivation? The BRI will no doubt boost trade, and it has given China access to a vast array of new markets. At home, domestic productivity and manufacturing is on the rise as these industries expand into China's rural regions. Chinese companies have become global conglomerates. China has had unprecedented growth in the last 25 years. As the US has scaled back their involvement in international trade agreements, President Xi has positioned himself as a champion for global cooperation and development and free trade. In 2018, the BRI extended into South America, the Caribbean, and the Arctic. Italy in 2019 became the first group of seven nations to sign up, despite warnings from its European and US allies. China is arguably the region's most important development partner. While their diplomatic relationship with many of the countries in the region is recent, they established relations with Guyana and Jamaica in the 1970s. China has offered loans and expertise to build miles and miles of highways. Throughout the region, they've donated security equipment to the military and the police and built a network of, of, of cultural centers. During the pandemic, it dispatched large shipments of test kits and masks and ventilators to help the region respond. These initiatives are part of a quiet but assertive push by China in recent years to expand its footprint in the region through government grants and loans, investments by Chinese companies, and diplomacy through their security efforts. In return, we've seen a rise and imported goods and services from China, but regionally, not the exponential exports to China. So for many in the region, there's an ongoing debate on if China is a valued partner or a predatory lender. To accommodate a growing economy and population in China, food security is going to be vital and the energy needs to support 1.5 billion people is astronomical. So countries like Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago can supply the natural gas and oil required for them to survive. In Dominica and Grenada, we can grow the necessary food for sustenance. So why wouldn't China practice checkbook diplomacy? In, 20, in 2021, China imported $174 million worth of petroleum, iron, scrap copper, 
in vehicle parts and alcohol from Trinidad and Tobago. China's influence has allowed it to garner new markets to sell their products, and this has led to a trade in equity with these new markets. Trinidad, for example, imported $605 million worth of Chinese goods in that same year. And they aren't alone. The Bahamas, between 2018 and 2020, exported 500,000 US dollars worth of goods to China. In turn, they imported $112 million worth of Chinese goods to the Bahamas. While in the newly oil-rich Guyana, Vice Chairman of the China Council for Promotion of International Trade, Zhang Xiaogang said that Guyana's imports to China, sorry, Guyana's exports to China accounted for 720 million so far this year. They're on track to their first billion dollar year with Guyana. So despite these investments, the Caribbean is vulnerable to rising sea levels and natural disasters. With the destruction of mangroves and deforestation, islands are more likely to experience de devastation through storm surges, high winds, and erosion. Similarly, transportation and tourism development has often meant the removal of natural vegetation and the destruction of marine ecosystems. These threats combined with rising income inequality and massive import bills are some of the concerns for regional governments. And so I think it's really important to consider what China is investing in the region. China has had 50 years of diplomatic relations with Jamaica. In, 20, in, in 2000, their bilateral trade totaled 58 million US dollars. Last year, it totaled 816 million US dollars. Jamaica is arguably, outside of Guyana, China's largest partner in the English-speaking Caribbean. Currently, there are more than 28 Chinese firms operating in Jamaica. Beijing has invested in roads, roads, and more roads to the tune of $800 million. They've made additional investments in a deep water port, tourism, bauxite, and sugar. One of the drawbacks of this investment is the limited use of local labor and local materials, since the Chinese import labor and import materials to finish these projects. In Jamaica this past weekend, Huawei just solidified its 15-year relationship on the island by opening a 9,000 square foot office. They've given $13.5 million in 15 idea hubs to support digital education and have promised another $300 million in investment. In Grenada, who began relations with China in 1985, severed it in 1989, and then resumed relationships in 2005, things are much the same. The resumption of relations with China in 2005 was precipitated by two devastating hurricanes that hit Grenada. Hurricane Ivan in 2004 and Hurricane Emily in 2005. 90% of the buildings on the island were destroyed. And so the Grenadians had to go find aid to be able to support their people. Uh, Dr. Keith Mitchell, the prime minister, said in 2020, we don't owe China. If you check the, the records of debt, it's not with China. More recently, China has invested in the expansion of the Maurice Bishop International Airport to the tune of $66 million. Having just been to Grenada, they need a new airport. Um, and they've made massive investments in low-cost housing and in sustainable agriculture. 
In Dominica, where China established relations in 2004, they pushed Dominica to stop recognizing Taiwan and recognize China. Now, reports vary on how much the Chinese government paid Dominica to be able to do this. The Economist reports it was about $122 million over five years. The money was used for infrastructure projects. China has invested heavily in agriculture, health, and education on the island, including when the Windsor Park St Stadium, the York Valley Bridge, and the China Dominica Friendship Hospital. In September of 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated the island. And Prime Minister Skerritt went on the radio and begged for aid to save his people. The Chinese gave 14 million US dollars in post-disaster restoration funding. As with Jamaica, Chinese workers work on these projects, and this has led to local resentment, especially in light of rising unemployment on the island. I think what's really important to note is that in November of 2021, Dominica became the second Caribbean country to be granted visa-free travel to China. The Bahamas began bilateral relations with China in 1997 and ramped up those relations in 2008. The Chinese have invested in a Confucius Institute in Abaco. They've built a $54 million highway, invested in a $3 billion mega port in Freeport. And if you're into luxury vacations, another $4.2 billion in the Barmar Resort in Nassau. More recently, Bahamians are negotiating a $23 million renovation on the Thomas Robinson Stadium, which has been on hold. The Chinese first built the stadium in about 2008, 2009 for about $30 million. In Antigua, China has invested in agriculture, education, infrastructure, and the Vivian R Richards Cricket Stadium and the VC Bird uh, International Airport. They're currently working on building an offshore medical university, a hotel, and a whole new financial economic district at Krabus on 100 acres of land. They're building a tourism and casino complex on Guinea Island, which is set to cost about $2 million in investment, $2 billion in investment. Now with Guinea Island, uh, a lot of the local conservationists are worried about the mangrove management and the environmental toll this is going to take. So in Antigua, it's illegal to destroy mangroves along the coast. And even though the Antiguan government has said it has done an environmental impact assessment, civil society is skeptical. Aerial photos, so Chinese are building this, this fancy resort, and so locals aren't really allowed on the island now. And so aerial photography has shown massive destruction of the mangroves, which is really devastating for Antiguans. So in Guyana, my home country, the Chinese have heavily invested in sugar, international airport, in educational scholarships. This summer, they sent 12 students to China to study. Last November, the Guyanese government asked the Chinese for $1.5 billion in infrastructure investments to fund six projects. The biggest one being a hydro dam, which Guyana is the land of many waters, and so I think it will, you know, without Chinese strings, it would be an interesting project to fund. Um, they've also asked for several highway projects. Guyana was once home to the longest floating bridge in the world, the Demerara Harbor Bridge. Now, a Chinese construction company has been commissioned by the government to build a new bridge. 
the China Railway Construction Company, to the tune of $260 million. Oil production has the potential to transform Guyana's economy. This year, the IMF projects that the country's GDP is going to grow by 60%. Guyana has 11 billion barrels of oil waiting to be recovered. It's against this backdrop that two weeks ago, the China National Offshore, <laughs> Offshore Oil Corporation, Petroleum Guyana Limited, opened its offices in Georgetown. So I think the big question is, or the looming question is, what are China's geopolitical intentions? And more importantly, why the Caribbean? So the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, markets are generally small, and most nations lack sizable mineral reserves and raw materials that often attract Chinese investors. I think we could take the African continent as an example. But the region has strategic importance for, as a hub for logistics, banking and commerce, and more importantly, could be of incredible value if there were a military conflict with the United States because of its proximity. So I've been obsessed with this idea of soft power. During my PhD, I thought, I'll, so for those of you who don't know, I did my PhD in New Zealand, and even in New Zealand, you could find Jamaican products. And so I was really obsessed with the idea of the transference of culture, even to far flung places of the earth. And so I've been thinking a lot about China's soft power. China has mastered the art of soft power in the last 25 years. Naya describes soft power as the ability of a country to persuade others to do what it wants without force or coercion. I say this not to mitigate the ways that China has wielded, wielded its hard power or its military might, but for us to consider the alternatives. In a 2015 interview with NPR, President Barack Obama said, if China is making investments that are building up infrastructure or improving education or helping the people, then we welcome that. We think that's great. The only thing is you got to make sure you look at what strings may be attached. So China has given lucrative financial incentives to Caribbean countries in order to keep them from relations with Taiwan. Current economies in the Caribbean have created a space that's ripe for Chinese patronage. Some Caribbean nations still maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan, St. Lucia, Haiti, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent, the Dominican Republic. In 2016, the Chinese government pushed, uh, published a uh, white paper outlining its policy in the region and said that they hope to carry out exchanges with the region's leader, leaders, legislators, political parties, and organizations on the basis of non-interference. They've established Confucius Institutes in Jamaica, Cuba, the Bahamas, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, and Suriname. And despite China's record on press freedom in 2018, they established the China Caribbean Press Center, which was an initiative by the Chinese Foreign Ministry to facilitate a month-long session of travel and exchanges for West Indian journalists to China. So while I am passionate about geopolitics in the Caribbean, I'm even more obsessed with the news, particularly newspapers. In the Caribbean, we have a very engaged civil society, and newspapers have been at the forefront of telling the stories of China's growing influence in the region. One of the great things about the region is its high level of press freedom. According to reporters 
According to the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index, Jamaica ranks 12 out of 180 countries. Trinidad at number 25 and Guyana at number 34. For a little bit of context, the US is at number 42. So some of the headlines coming out of regional newspapers have been most enlightening as we look at China's influence in the region. In Antigua, Mandarin is being introduced in high schools. In Jamaica, the Chinese have repeatedly placated fears about their influence on the island. In the Bahamas, the Chinese ambassador has written editorials. In the local papers in Guyana, the ambassador is regularly quoted. And there seems to be a never ending stream of bilateral trade talks between the Guyanese government and Beijing. Newsrooms have weighed in on regional agreements and disagreements with Chinese firms and are closely following the conflict between China and Taiwan and China and the United States. So I've read and analyzed a multitude of regional newspapers. In the news patterns you can see across the region, there's a marked increase in the coverage of China since 2018. There's a heavy focus on business. A lot of this is interspersed with cultural elements. China has made massive investments in sports. They're calling it sports diplomacy. They have made even more investments in infrastructure projects. And in the news, there's this overarching pro-Chinese investment agenda. Some of the present news themes include the idea that the Chinese are buying influence in the region through their investments. Beijing, there's a concern around Beijing's increasing footprint in Latin America and the Caribbean, and an ever-present fear that Chinese firms are displacing local companies and exacerbating unemployment. There's also a running theme of the Caribbean's previous experiences with investors and with colonization. So there's been a lot of pushback in the media. In the newspapers that allow comments, those discussions are enlightening. So the first comment is from a Guyanese paper, and he says, well, or they say, welcome to the new colonists. And the second comment is from a Bahamian newspaper, and they say, for a fair balance, we shall look forward to Taiwan's viewpoint being expressed. In the Jamaica Gleaner, John Witt says China doesn't give but they're looking for a return favor sometime down the line. Mark my word, there's no free lunch, not ever. And then again from, another, from the same Bahamian paper, it says we need to get the Confucius Institute and all the representatives of the sinister and ruthless evil Xi Jinping communist-led party out of our country and the sooner the better. What's interesting is that regional governments are aware of the growing discontent. Dominica's ambassador to China, Martin Charles, in an interview with the Global Times in 2019 said, I will not support criticism of this initiative. I believe it's brought prosperity to the world and it will continue to bring prosperity, especially to the less fortunate countries. I endorse this initiative as a way forward to advance the economic development of many countries. Now on the ground, we're having a lot of conversations. And I think those conversations can be categorized into four groups. We've got the skeptical, the disgruntled, the resigned, and the apathetic. So those who are disgruntled are really concerned about unemployment opportunities and China's hidden agenda. For many of us, 
Okay, let me do that again. Those who are skeptical <laughs> are concerned about, those who are skeptical are concerned about China's investments in the region and their hidden agenda. Those who are disgruntled are concerned about this whole idea of recolonization and the decreased knowledge transfer, particularly when we're thinking about employment issues. Because when the Chinese bring their laborers in, they're not transferring that knowledge to locals so that they can continue these projects. There are those who are resigned. And the resigned believe that, look, we need this money. This is the only way we're going to survive in the region. And that China has been really good for the Caribbean. And then there are those who are apathetic. And they're connected to the conversations that governments have been having in the region since pre-independence in the 1950s and the 1960s. And they're concerned about the debt that the region's in with loans from the IMF and the World Bank. And they're wondering, why do we keep having these conversations over and over again? So the overarching question becomes, what does it take for the region to become self-sustainable? So I think the, it's unclear whether Chinese influence in the region is negative or positive. I think it's likely somewhere in the middle. China is balancing building infrastructure, giving aid, providing vaccines, and access to education, all while having questionable environmental practices, benefiting from trade agreements, and battling local sentiment. China appears to be fully cognizant of the tension with locals and the United States, and has been proactive about managing perceptions, particularly as they balance China's entrepreneurial aspirations with their philanthropic duties. I think the best way to consider their role in the region is as nuanced. These regional economies are struggling. They're struggling with job creation. They're struggling with declining foreign direct investment, increasing social demands and pressures to create a sustainable economy. At the moment, China is a lifeline. There's still questions about what their ultimate goals are. But as they build their influence around the world, I imagine the chickens will soon come home to roost. Debts will be called in and strategic alliances formed, especially when it comes to voting bodies like the United Nations. But what is abundantly clear is that China may be the US's number one threat to global hegemony and its interests in the Americas. I hope I haven't dissuaded you from your next Caribbean vacation. After all, the more revenue these countries earn from diversifying their economies, the less dependent they will be on foreign governments like China and even the United States. Before I end, I really want to take some time to highlight the current humanitarian situation in Haiti. Haiti is currently facing mass food shortages fuel shortages, and even water shortages. According to the United Nations, the island is witnessing catastrophic hunger with more than 4 million Haitians facing acute food insecurity. This has been triggered by a blockade of a fuel terminal by local gangs. This all began in September. Always feels like Haiti can't catch a break. But this has left the government pleading for military assistance. The UN Secretary General has proposed a rapid action force to go in, confront the, grand, confront the gangs, and get the terminal back. The United States and Mexico have suggested that a security mission be led by a partner country. I think the Caribbean is ready to pitch in but most nations are afraid of an armed conflict. And so the question becomes, who can afford to step in and help Haiti? Will it be the Chinese? 
that's it. <laughs> Yes. Nikki. So has there any been any talk about um, using Chinese investment as a bulwark against the United States in terms of foreign policy, sort of decentering the United States influence in the region by attracting Chinese investment? I don't think that's the case. I think we're just in survival mode at this point. I, I think so. When the when the crash happened in 2008, the U.S. had to take care of their own. And then six years ago, you had a new government that was very focused on home again. And so in order to survive when you're having two or three hurricanes a year, we've got to find money from somewhere. And so I don't even think there's a focus on the U.S. It's just a focus on how do we feed our people. Mike? Close kinship in journalism is public relations. Mm -hmm. So, how centralized is the Chinese approach to messaging in all of these vibrant and vocal journalistic communities? So, I think the Chinese can hold a press conference at least once a week on something. Um, I think they are very aware of local sentiment around them being in the region. And because there are all of these new bilateral agreements, there's always something to announce. Can you imagine in a, in a country like Jamaica where you've got 28 plus, I think it's about 32 Chinese firms operating, plus a, an ambassador. There's always something to announce. There's always progress on a project. There's always the opening of something. They're, they're giving to things like schools. They're giving to, to local soccer programs. And so they're, <laughs> they're building an incredible amount of goodwill. And so I think they're acutely aware of, of the PR machine behind them. And when, when they say press conference, of course, the media shows up. The, the launch this weekend in Jamaica, the, the tech company launch, I mean, Huawei has serious issues with the US. In Jamaica, they are blowing money like it's nobody's business. You know, but how does Jamaica navigate? They are trying to digitize a country. They're trying to make sure that their people are, are tech savvy. And so if they're going to come in and help them do it, then why not? Amanda. What do you mean? Do you mean Chinese investment? Well, China helped to, to foot some of these wars. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the US, the US already has, has massive loans that they're paying back to China. We just don't talk about it. Yes. So what is the percentage of population now in the Caribbean of Chinese, individuals of Chinese descent? So it's, I think it depends on the country. So in Guyana, you probably have about 2 or 3%. In Trinidad, probably about 2 or 3%. In Jamaica, it's, it's pockets. But um, in Jamaica, for example, when I was in high school, they had a Chinese free zone. And so instead of uh, making clothes and manufacturing stuff in China, they would bring Chinese to the region and manufacture those things. And so my next door neighbors, there are about 30 Chinese living in the house across from us. Um, but those people inevitably go home. What's interesting is that if you go in, in downtown Kingston in Jamaica, a lot of those businesses are owned by Chinese. My husband and I were in Aruba last year. All of the grocery stores are owned by Chinese. And they have Chinese names. And so there are, are there still descendants of the Chinese who came in the 1800s? So I think it's more descendants. Yeah, the Chinese who came between 1890 and 1940. And so, but I think there's you found that this new generation of Chinese have assimilated. Um, so it's always interesting to hear people of Chinese descent speaking Creole or speaking Patwa, especially when you're in the States, because you're not used to it. Um, but at home, it's, it's so normal. Um, I think what you're finding, because 
we're having these massive infrastructure projects happening and Chinese are coming to the region in mass to help build these projects, some of them are staying. They're, meet, they're meeting local women and they're starting families and they're realizing that you know there are ways for us to be prosperous here and so they stay. Um, in Guyana a few years ago, there was an issue with people who had come to build the Marriott Hotel in Georgetown. The government was accused of giving Guyanese passports to foreign nationals who had decided to stay in the country without the requisite waiting time. Um, and so I think across the region, what you're going to see is, is a rapidly diversifying population. In Guyana, with all of the oil money, I think soon there are going to be more foreigners there than locals. Yes, Sophia. Well, I think China's got eight trillion dollars to invest, and a lot of it they're giving is in is in grants, right? So some of this money they they don't even have to pay back, and so why would I take a loan when I can get free money from the Chinese? And in in truth and in fact, a lot of these Asian countries are dealing with their own issues. They don't have time to be investing anywhere else. I mean, if you look at what's happening in Sri Lanka or look at what's happening in India, in Malaysia. Um, even in those countries, there's rising income inequality. And so they've, they've got no room to take care of anybody. Whereas China, you've got a massively rising middle class. And so they've got more than enough wiggle room. I think growth has slowed this year, particularly with the virus, but they're still on track to give money. Yes, Vita. Mm -hmm. and the United Kingdom, right? I mean, the same sort of a transaction that was conducted in almost a semi-colonial setting mm -hmm. is what seems to be replicated, and it therefore seems to reflect a pattern from China. Well, we will show you what, you know, we were victimized with mm -hmm. in terms of uh, Hong Kong. The second, well, as part of that, the other historical element that also struck me as particularly significant is that of Italy being the country out of all the G7 nations to strike a deal with China in, and where the historical parallel lies is with Marco Polo, right? I mean, the entire context mm -hmm. of the Italian relationship uh, with the Chinese. And then, of course, the geopolitics. We have a tendency in Western theoretical perspective to look at politics through a very dualistic lens. Is it hard power or is it soft power? Mm -hmm. And we often, therefore, tend to limit ourselves in terms of our response. Oh, it is only soft power or it is only hard power. But where, again, the Chinese have been masterful is in seeking a foreign policy that combines the two. Right? Absolutely. So building stadium, you are influencing a younger generation. You are influencing an urban generation by providing agricultural sustainability uh, to the rural areas, you then get a rural population. Mm -hmm. So I wonder to what extent you think, again, is it our lenses itself that also limits how we can predict China's behavior? I, th I think, particularly here in the States, we've been taught to think about China as the boogeyman. Um, and I think those narratives are incredibly per pervasive. And because of our proximity to the Caribbean, some of that stuff has, has trickled down. Um, I think what the region is struggling with now is, um, you know, how do we change narratives? Because we can see the good that's happening. But I think they are acutely aware that China will flip a switch in the drop of a hat. So I don't think that it's one or the other for the region. Um, I think my concern is around the UN. 
um, and and now if 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 China can amass 149 nations to vote with them, that pushes the U.S. out. You know, and and that can have massive repercussions, not necessarily for for my lifetime, but but for the generations to come. This evening, I have learned a lot, <laughs> for sure. But I wanted to recognize Dr. Lewis with a certificate for your office oh, or wherever you'd you. like to hang it up, and a little gift basket. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll see you in November for our next university lecture series by Dr. David Gosling from the um, Clinical and Mental Health Counseling Program. So thank you.